Alright. A few, a few words about Berlioz. Um, he, was, he was born in 1803, and this symphony was written in 1830 in Paris. Um, he was not a prodigy, a prodigy like uh, Mozart or Beethoven, and he did not even have a lot of success on a single instrument um, while he was growing up. But he loved music. His parents didn't think that was a reasonable career, and they said, you need to be a doctor. And they said, well, you know, we'll send you to Paris if you study to be a doctor. He said, well, okay, Paris, doctor, okay, I can make this work. And when he was in Paris, he discovered a few things that really influenced his music. One were Beethoven symphonies. He heard Beethoven symphonies, was so impressed and thought, I want to write things like that. He heard the opera, and he saw Shakespeare. There was a traveling English troupe that came through and was in Paris for a while and had several plays that were shown, and as I know you all talked about a little bit, he saw Harriet Smithson, who was an actress, and he just fell head over heels for her. Um, he quit medical school and enrolled in the Paris Conservatory to be a composer. Now, obviously, he had to have some demonstrable talent to be able to get into the best music school in Paris um, or in France, um, but he did, and he was accepted to be a composer. And it was this lack of a traditional upbringing and a traditional training that I think led to a lot of his inventiveness and his creativity, breaking some molds that a lot of people may not have done had they had more of that typical traditional um, training, both as a player and as a as a composer. And Berlioz was the first composer that everybody really agreed was modern. Now Beethoven was a pretty unique guy, but some people would put him in the classical category, some would put him in the romantic category, some wouldn't put him in any category and say he was just Beethoven. In a lot of ways he was revolutionary, but he did straddle a lot of the more traditional ways and then some modern ways too. It was Berlioz who broke a lot of molds, and if people said, for good or ill, he was a modern composer. Um, another thing about Berlioz is he was somebody who really lived the romantic ideal. There were, you know, you guys probably read about some people who wrote things, but that didn't co exactly correspond to their lives, like. Um, Ben Franklin, who wrote about humility and simplicity and chastity, <laughs> and then went running around Paris with lots of Parisian women. Or, or uh, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote that all men are created equal and kept slaves. Um, but Berlioz really followed his romantic ideals, too, for good and evil as well. But um, he lived what, what he thought. Um, some things about the, the romantic or the symphony fantastique. Berlioz intentionally tried to synthesize music and literature into an inclusive art form, um, combining the story with the music. As I mentioned in last week with the Beethoven lecture, that romantic composers, as they, as they changed the typical homophonic forms of the classical era, had particular problems. Because what the audience expected wouldn't always be what happened. And they dealt with those problems in different ways. One was through miniatures. They would write a small, short piece that dealt with a single idea or a mood. Sometimes combine a bunch of those together. But that was one way. Another way was these grandiose, kind of big, sort of staged oratorio type things. Berlioz wrote several of those and that were not very successful. Um, Ms. Uh, Stevenson and I saw the opening of the Chicago Symphony this year, where they played the Symphony Fantastique, and followed Berlioz's instructions to follow that piece of music with the next one, which was called Lelio, which the Chicago Symphony had never done before, and I think probably for good reason. You know, it was just really different. There was a narrator who embodied, who in person was represented um, Berlioz. It was the actor Gerard Depardieu, who you might have seen in the he kind of goes on about this 
you know, self-serving narration, oh, woe is me, sort of troubled artist, and there were soloists, and there was a choir, and there was an orchestra behind a scrim, and it, it was kind of a big muddle, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, it was kind of odd. Some other things that Berlioz had did, probably his most famous, is uh, Romeo and Juliet. He did a kind of an oratorio-like thing with that. Um, or The Damnation of Faust, which was actually staged last year with the Lyric Opera as a full opera. Um, that was not what Berlioz's intent was. No costumes, no staging, but soloist, choir, orchestra, and things like that. And then <clears throat> the third way that composers dealt with those problems was through program music. And that Berlioz was much more successful with. <coughs> um, a, a, a characteristic of that program music, as we mentioned with Beethoven, was the idea of thematic unity, where there is a theme that comes back and is trans 